plug for December 2023. Tonight's topic is storytelling and the act and art of storytelling, especially in our winter months, is a way of nurturing connections between people. By sharing lived experiences in oral and written narrative form, we can reflect, imagine, learn, and express emotion through imagery built on the creativity of the human spirit and our desires to communicate. Thank you for joining us this evening, and we'd like to pause for a moment and acknowledge that here at the Millicent Rogers Museum, we are located on ancestral lands of the Tiwa speaking people known today as the Red Willow people of Taos Pueblo. We strive to deepen our relationship with the Red Willow people through collaboration while acknowledging and honoring the complex history of the Red Willow people past, present, and future generations. We express gratitude to this land and to the Taos Pueblo elders and ancestors who have stewarded this land since time immemorial. I'd like to welcome our guest tonight, Wendy Ulfers, tells us that she began writing stories in 2014 about living overseas and published them in an online blog called A Taste of Mind. For 31 years from 1987 to 2018, Wendy lived with her family in five countries, beginning in Singapore, Cyprus, Taiwan, Germany, and France. Home base was always Estes Park, Colorado, where they returned full-time to their cabin in 2020. Later, after repatriating to the U.S. in 2018, Wendy's story writing expanded to interesting people and places right here in America. Storytelling is one of life's greatest sharing adventures. So welcome, Wendy. Thank you. And welcome to James Walsh, who is an associate professor in the political science department at the University of Colorado, Denver, where he has taught for the past 26 years specializing in labor, immigration, social movements, and the I Irish diaspora. Walsh is also founder of the Romero Theater Troupe, a social justice community theater that uses the stage to preserve people's history and to educate the public about human rights struggles. Welcome, James. And Michelle Potter is a writer and photographer living in Taos, New Mexico, in addition to her creative work, Michelle teaches skiing at Taos Ski Valley and previously taught writing and American studies at UNM Taos campus. Her doctorate explores the interrelationship between nature and culture and inspires her to always find the story in everything. Welcome, Michelle. And welcome, Sarah, my friend and moderator of our conversation. If you'd like to get us started. I do. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here in this busy, busy December. Um, and we want to start off with definitions because storytelling, oh, it's a big thing. Uh, every rec center, every uh, independent university has a program about storytelling. How do you tell your memoir? How do you do this? How do you do that? And in actual fact, storytelling encompasses a huge number of things, all the way from a formal biography to autobiography, memoirs of all sorts of kinds of things, uh, blogs, um, a Native American legends and traditional histories. And so I, I want to ask each one of you to give an idea of what um, what you like storytelling to be, because it is all those things. So James, won't you start us off as um, I, I know your your Irish heritage is is totally fascinating to me because I have absolutely none. And I'm willing, wanting to hear more. Yeah, I'm not sure where to start. Um, where, 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 where we're beginning now, all I know is that storytelling is the theme. Um, so uh, should I just dive in full, full bore or, or? Dive right in. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I, I like to tell my students who are confused 18, 19 and 20 year olds that the greatest skill they can take away from their education, no matter what their, their major or discipline is the skill of telling stories well. That, that 
every profession, every career. Um, that's that's a, a, a very important skill to have. So that's often a surprise to them when to, to hear that. Um, for me, storytelling has has shaped the way I do my work, um, but I didn't always know the importance of storytelling and teaching until I was doing it for a couple of years. And, um, you know, I, I started teaching the way that teachers are taught to, to teach, which is to shovel data at students and force them to memorize it for an exam. Um, what Paulo Freire calls the banking method of, of teaching. And after a couple of years of that, I realized nothing was happening in that space, meaningful, and relationships weren't being built. So I started um, asking, doing two things. One was asking students to interview elders in their families. Mm. Um, this was a history class. Uh, so um, engaging students with oral history Mm -hmm. transformed my classrooms, transformed students' experience with, with their education, and it empowered students to teach the class. They would bring stories to class. The, one, the students on the margins of the room who were quiet and detached would come into the room with eyes wide open because they had just interviewed someone, their grandparents, and they had stories to share. And so student ownership of the class began to grow and 26 years later, I still use oral history. And I still get emails from former students whose elders have passed away and they're grateful that they have a recording of their story. Mm -hmm. So there is a sacredness about, the storytelling is the oldest, it's been called the, the oldest human art form. And I remind my students that every one of us engages in, in oral tradition on a daily basis. Mm -hmm with loved ones, with significant mm -hmm. others and children. We just check in about how our day went. And there we are, we're engaging in that beautiful art. So that has moved into the stage and history. I started a theater troupe that yeah. puts stories on stage. And so, and so I just wanted to start there and just make a mention of how my own career has been shaped by this beautiful art. That is absolutely wonderfully said. And your points up is the geometry, the dimensionality of what storytelling brings to history, because each story is from a different angle, a different set of precepts, if you will, uh, a, different, a different place culturally. And as we bring those together, suddenly there is a woven document of what our lives have been like and it is so far past what the as you said <laughs> the shoving the the information down one's neck it, it has no context and so this is I, you you said it all actually we could probably quit now except the girls want to ask <laughs> okay. so uh, michelle you you've taught also how Hi. I, I I love uh, hearing what you've you've said, James. And I've looked at your classes, and I I'd like to take pretty much all of your classes <laughs> because um, you know I have a back my my master's is in um, fiction, and I'm kind of a smart ass and say yeah, but I don't believe in fiction. And um, my doctorate's in American studies, um, which really broadens things. I feel like in my master's I learned how to teach, and I feel like in my doctorate I learned how to write. Um, but but I had that similar experience when I was first teaching at, 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 during my master's program at Rutgers uh, in New Jersey. I um, I asked my students in Composition 101 to write personal stories, and I, I had that same experience. I was shocked when people showed me the blood on the floor, mm -hmm. and it's related. You know, the classroom was so supportive of each other that I was amazed at the energy I got from these students by their own writing of their own own lives. Um, and the other thing I think about is um, here in Taos, oh, it's been 20 years maybe, I ended up teaching, uh, uh, substitute teaching for a very short time at Taos High School. And I remember one day going into somebody's history class 
And uh, the students had an assignment from their teacher, which was to get up and talk to to uh, talk about World War II, which is something I'm writing very heavily about in my old, own book. And they got up and they and they started um, uh, with their piece of paper that they printed off the internet um, about you know and re reading history about World War II. And I said, "Does your teacher let you do this?" And they said, "Sure." <laughs> anyway, <laughs> And afterwards, I said, this is 20 years ago. I said, why don't you guys go home and talk to your grandfathers? Talk to your grandparents about this while you still have them. And so I'm just saying I'm, I'm excited about those same same notions. And uh, when the two of you come from a slightly similar place, mm -hmm. when you come from a very different place, namely the experiences of living as a world citizen in so many places and suddenly realizing that there are all these stories out there and they wow. are recording and telling and it, it, tell us how you feel like a conduit of those stories um, almost blog style wendy well, yeah, I came into story writing, not academically like um, the other members of the panel, but rather serendipitously because we were living in France um, in 2014 and our children had grown. It was just my husband and, and myself in Paris, but I just started thinking there are so many places and people and the intersections of adventures and sometimes gathered around the table where food was shared. And um, mm -hmm. I was very uh, motivated by the writings of MFK Fisher, who was oh, yeah. a, an yeah. author of the last century. And she inspired me because of her stories often told in gatherings of people around the table and the communion of spirits um, while sharing food. That was sort of the model for initially for my own story writing. And so I took experiences of our family over these 30 years and remembered certain things and then would write a short narrative about it. And it ended up being kind of a memoir for our children would say, well, I don't remember that. And I said, well, you work a little bit young, but you remember where we were and who these people are. And so that was that was the catalyst for the beginning. Um, but then when we came home, I realized that my curiosity extended beyond my own memories and things that had happened to our family to the people I was meeting back here in the United States because we'd lived away for so long. So I started interviewing people and writing about them, an artist friend that I made in Santa Fe and and the, the man, uh, Esteban, who has the oldest um, trading post in Taos that uh, I wrote about, and that's how I met Sarah. So it's, yeah, it's its own evolution, but it continues. And one thing I will say that I, I love the Joan Didion quote, that we tell ourselves stories in order to live. And I, I believe that's true, no matter if it, your story comes from your own self or from an interview or or talking to your elders. It's it's all there. That is so true. Uh, my own heritage being Pennsylvania Dutch and uh, early, early American settlers, uh, we called sometimes uh, that the older people were also telling yarns mm -hmm. to pull the leg of the younger generation and that there was only a, just a, a sous-son of truth in what was being said. And of course, that's kind of uh, something of the West too. Uh, mm -hmm. Exaggeration stories that are just totally over the top. Uh, and yet we know and love those as, as much as the ones that are real memories. And mm -hmm. of yeah. course, uh, we had, um, when I first started the Unplugged Voices book, uh, and it just, it expanded like mad very quickly of listening to people. That's all you have to do is mm -hmm. once and they start telling you. And I think Jim just told us that even the, the kids that know nothing at 18, 19 or so, uh, once they had the impetus to ask, it, the thing blossomed. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's been your experience, Jim, 
through more than two decades? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I teach, I teach um, overwhelmingly first generation college students. Mm -hmm. So I'm not teaching at a, a school where most of the students are coming from economic privilege. And I think students, first generation students are much closer to a working class um, existence and to traditions where literacy has been denied to people are, are not accessible. And so what that means is that oral, oral tradition is much more deeply rooted, I believe, in um, students from working class backgrounds. So I find great joy in that. And, stu and, and I also think students have been socialized to think of education as passive. Mm -hmm. They are there to absorb and to memorize and to take exams. And so turning students from objects to subjects in a classroom is a transformative experience and it's done through storytelling. It's done through inviting their stories forth. Mm -hmm. And once that um, ice is broken, there's no limit to what uh, potential pours out of, mm -hmm. of these young people um, who may have never imagined themselves in graduate school or may have never imagined themselves reaching for a career that seemed unattainable. So once engaged, that the ceiling's off and the way to the way to engagement is storytelling now a lot of my colleagues can grasp that intellectually but to get there in praxis is something else no. to really to really engage with students and listen to them fully and invite their expertise forth is a different thing because um, people with PhDs love to listen to themselves talk <laughs> <laughs> I, I would like I would like to jump in on this Sarah a little bit because um I'm loving these connections and and um so I just like to share that my background is in public school teaching the museum world is sort of a second career for me and I taught I've taught everything from preschool to um high school and a significant significant amount of time teaching middle school students with autism in a self-contained um, classroom. Mm -hmm. And the storytelling piece is so essential. I can really connect with what you're um, saying, James, because getting the kids to talk about themselves and um, then that the lessons flow from that rather organically. Interestingly, in a self-contained class, you're often teaching all subjects. And um, so much more learning takes place when the math organically evolves through the relevance of a story about grandma's bread or something. And um, so it's, it's just wonderful to hear you discussing that around the collegiate level. Also, I'd like to make the connection. I am really interested in learning tonight from all of you because, you know, it's very much the, the trend in museums talking about storytelling. Museums no longer want to tell people what they have and what what is there to learn and so we are really reaching into communities and engaging with people's stories and that's the way to be you know a relevant aspect of of our own community so um i really appreciate the words that you've all put forth so far and now i'll be quiet and let you keep talking <laughs> And I loved everything you said. And I want to go back to Wendy because what you said about your time in Paris reminds yeah. my first French teacher. So we're talking um, sixth grade. Mm -hmm. She taught French by taking everyone on a travelogue through Paris. Oh, mm. love. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the places while gaining vocabulary. And so it was a dimensionality thing. And it it had, it, it was something real. You don't remember a, a word just to remember it for itself. It, you remember it 
because it means something. And so tell us more about um, uh, your experience in Paris. I think that's what I'm asking. Well, I, I'm a lucky girl because we were able to live our last eight years overseas uh, while my husband was the director of the American School in Paris. And um, as I had mentioned, our kids had already graduated, were back um, living and working in the U.S. So it was just the two of us. And um, while he was the worker bee, I was the adventurer who found the things to do and the places to go. And I did study the language and spoke passable French or Wendy French, as I call it. <laughs> and um, and it's true, the, just the people that I met there and or anywhere that we lived overseas, that was one of the ways that we became close very quickly is beca because we came together as expatriates in a foreign country as guests living there and our backgrounds were very diverse but we so we had to get to know each other quickly and it was through the stories of where we'd been and what we're interested in doing and what connections that we had with maybe other people overseas because it is kind of a little fraternity in the international education world people hop around to schools and so you know a lot of people through other people but I think it's it's just the way we connect as people um, that then evolves into a greater storytelling the longer you get to know someone or the more you learn about them and want to explore that um, whether it's just in listening or whether it's writing it down and it's just, it's fascinating because we share, we we learn through stories, we laugh with stories, we cry with stories. All of the human emotions are right there in this package right in front of us, whether we're speaking together or uh, writing it and someone's reading um, those, those shared words. It, what you just said was important. We learn about it. Uh, it the scenario is um, a, a bunch of neighbors gather and one person starts out, I, I've had this strange experience. And then other people chime in and say, well, I did this and such in, in that time or whatever. And it, it's not really story. And yet it is the learning. And Michelle, I, I saw that you wanted to... Uh, oh. Well, I guess what I'm thinking about, um, it, it, Wendy, I know you you write about food food as sort of a milieu, or maybe more than food, the the table, the table, the gap, the gathering around the table, and what happens with mm -hmm. with that if you have that as your template, because that's where people often sit in a circle and you're sharing food, but the conversations that yes. we had overseas around tables, it was just it was more i don't know it just jumped into a different realm or depth or um mm -hmm. I, I it would just it was a, it was it was worth writing about it was worth exploring and remembering i'll i'll put it that way but i i do like to say that um my stories don't always have food in them but they always have an adventure so it's not yeah. just I'm not a food writer per se. No, you're not a food writer, but necessarily from what I can see from your website, but what I appreciate about it is the setting of the table where people can come together. As you say, this is how I feel too. The food is really secondary to the conversation, but you try to set the table in such a way that people will want to tell their stories. And I'm also a huge fan of MFK Fisher. Oh. Who, never, who never wrote a cookbook. She's no. writing about culture and she's writing about friendship. Mm -hmm. And as I think about this somewhat, I think um, the way, you know, how many times a day do we do we encounter these stories with people? For me, it, I, I, I'm ADHD, so often I have to write in coffee shops where, where I'm not distracted by my own house, you know? But I get so many conversations with people that way, but also my milieu is skiing. So part of the joy for me of teaching skiing for a really long time is that I often, and often I have private lessons, which I especially love because it's one-on-one. -on -one. And the piece I wrote in Sarah's book is about hitchhiking. And often that's one-on-one. -on -one. And it's that intimacy of being in a space with one other people. It doesn't matter if it's a coffee shop or a chairlift or, or the other thing I notice is, is I lear learn who people are by how they move. 
you know, through skiing, I will see how someone is learning. I can watch their mind at work. It's so much fun. Um, but I love the way my life has finally come to this place where it's been set up into my writing so I can think about what I'm writing or these conversations can come together for me. Uh, right now, I would say particularly in a more one-on-one -on -one way, which, you know, classrooms, classroom teaching didn't always allow that. And I get such such joy from that. But we all have different milieus that work for us at different parts of our life. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, James, uh, from what Michelle just said, do your students gesture when they tell their stories? Mm. Oh, absolutely. Um, that's, there's a physicality about storytelling. And I think that's one of the one of the problems of our of the screen culture is that we miss some of that. We miss a lot of that now. So, um, but you know, I, I like the way you describe Michelle watching someone ski, and you can tell they're thinking. And so, <clears throat> one of the things I've done in in my classrooms is not just have students do oral history and bring the stories to class and write about them. But they're required to to choose a story and perform it. I love it. In other words, to build a skit around the story for the class and perform it. And usually they play the 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 main character in the whether it's their grandparent or your uncle. And so mm -hmm. and so yeah, that 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 really has an impact on the class to see someone perform a story. And that's one of the reasons I think theater is such an important part of storytelling is is that um you know the 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 greatest moment the most pregnant moment i've ever experienced is that is that 10 seconds before the curtain opens at, at a live theater show because for just a minute anything's possible and and when that curtain starts to open you you don't know what you're about to witness <laughs> and i think a story is like that um I've learned, you know, that the the way you introduce a story goes a long way toward whether you keep your listener. So you have to be very careful about how you how you open that door into the story. Um, especially now when people are really in their lives are very rushed and no one wants to pause for five minutes and hear a story. <laughs> so I like to help my students work on the first line the way that you get people's interest, you know? And so, um, but uh, this, this, this is all very, you know, useful to me and, and interesting and inspiring to be in a, a small community just here tonight of people who, who see the, the value and the centrality in our lives of storytelling. And I think those of us who are parents understand also how storytelling relates to raising children mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, really really it is the vehicle to pass down knowledge and wisdom ah. um, they're the, the really I mean when you show a child something it may or may not stick but when you put it in the form of a story then that's that, that's going to have legs yeah so so as a parent I've learned to always to use storytelling in that way too and in my in in relationships you know you 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 sit down and you share you update each other on your stories <laughs> where what turns has your story taken and and that's how we build so so I, yeah again in every facet of life and um you know i i i i think i i'm a little sad when i meet people who who haven't who haven't gained that appreciation who see um life as transactional uh, only and um every encounter is just a transaction to be something to be taken away from instead of every encounter being an opportunity um to you know to to enter into something new and and so, yeah, I, I, I could, 
relate storytelling, I think, to any facet of life. And 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 that's really one of the it's the healing that those in the mental health field certainly understand the, the intense value of telling the story of trauma, telling the story of separation, telling the story of loss. Um, war veterans, as hard as it is to tell stories. One of my favorite books is by Tim O'Brien, The Things They Carried About Vietnam, his experiences in Vietnam when he was 19. And he opens the book by saying, storytelling saved my life. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess I guess my contribution tonight is storytelling saved my career. <laughs> <laughs> If, if I can jump in to um, just respond to something James said about the beginning of a story, which is, it is the whip that's going to bring the reader, um, if it's a written story, to going beyond the first sentence or paragraph. But I've also learned that the way you end it is almost just as important of, of bringing it home about why did you even engage and starting this story, what's the what's the the message around it, or what is it that you're trying to to bring home to the to the reader? And um, it's yeah, it's something that has evolved in my writing. And my husband, I call him my editor extraordinaire because I never publish until he gives it the green light and all the eyes are dotted and t's crossed, and the the thoughts are transitioning in a way that carries the story along to the person that's either listening or or reading it that's great uh i it's hilarious that you added this wendy right now because i was going to ask you uh, we're moving kind of into the mechanics of short storytelling mm -hmm. and james talked about how the first sentence grabbing the audience is yeah. so and you, as a blog mistress, uh, I can call you that, uh, something of a magician, uh, that first thing is so important to say, that you get the ears open. Uh, and, and again, as James said, getting the kids' attention. But we're all kids to some extent. Uh -huh. about and so how, how do you deal with that, that first sentence, that first grab? And that's a really good question because I I do it in different ways. I'm a I'm a huge believer and user of other people's words. I use a lot of quotes in my stories that I think emphasize and tell a little bit more about what this is really about. And um, so I often start depending on the subject with a quote or two, and and or end with one uh, that again is is embracing someone else's writing that I think enhances my own and and gives more credence or clarity to to what's being written about but but I just sometimes sometimes the first sentence just comes naturally because I'm so certain of this is what I want to write about and at other times my husband will say nope you're not quite there yet so go back and think about it and so I, I don't, I don't, because I'm not um, a writer uh, by trade or by profession, I, I don't have a perfect uh, evolution. It's a little bit serendipitous, I guess. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Can I speak to that then? Yes. Yeah, there's, there's this idea, and, and, and James, you had said this, that we have to be so careful with that first line. There's this idea that that first line has to be just write or something and, and that we have to bring it home at the end, you know, a story. What's that? Um, it's where um, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Something happened. I forget what had a great fall. I, as a writer, and maybe this is the ADHD in me. Oh my, I wish I didn't have to think so hard and be so careful. That's my middle name. Try too hard and do too much. It doesn't serve me as a writer oftentimes. Well, if I could just jump in again, too, the other thing I've learned is sometimes what you leave out is as important uh, of carrying uh, your reader along, giving yeah. them the intelligence to make the connection that you don't have to put down 
you know, A, B, C to Z. And okay. there is a, that's another transitioning where the reader is brought along by their own intelligence of what's really the next, um, what you aren't saying, I guess. I think you make such a good point, Wendy, with the, the reader being brought along. So the reader is part yeah. of the story. That's a huge, that's a huge aspect of it, considering the audience. And I'm, I'm, I'm really um, finding connections in what you all are saying about museum interpretive practices and the fact that we are telling, we're always telling other people's stories. And yeah. so much the first line, much like um, giving a museum tour or docent trainings, it's interesting because I've been at this museum for five years and of course, two of those were pandemic. And since uh, rebuilding the docent program, we don't have anything that's scripted. And this is sometimes hard for people to understand who haven't experienced it, but you'll, and I've kind of insisted on this, even if you make a mistake, even if you don't pull the, the visitor in immediately with your intro, the fact that you're being human and real and organic and making connections mm -hmm. just talk to people and yeah. there's so much to tell that exactly what you said wendy what you leave out is also impactful mm -hmm. so um and there so really i can equate docenting to oral histories and oral storytelling because you might be asking, so what brought you in today? Or, right. or if, if I'm thinking about the, I'm trying to take pressure off myself, I guess, as a writer for having the perfect intro. Sometimes right. the other day I heard a piece of advice that really got me. It's like, all right, why don't you start start something with the last text you sent someone? And I'm like, the last text I sent someone was, I guess you could make me do anything. <laughs> or I started a, a, a blog that I did recently with, why won't they let me photograph at a Turk's pajamas. And, and so where does that little spark of, of creativity or borrowing or, or inquisition or whatever come from? But unfortunately, I'm one of those people that, that ends up writing every single draft 33 times. Mm -hmm. and I do not love that about me. And it, it sometimes hampers my writing and other times it helps it, but it's, it's, it feels like such a hapless business. I think stepping away from it is helpful sometimes too. If I feel like I'm stuck or it's not coming together, I'll just, I'll take a break of even half a day or a day. And the next day, just new eyes on it, new heart into it um, can really help. Um, it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't have to all be in one sitting or 33 versions. It's just whatever it takes to get to the end that you that you're what you want to stamp as your as your message. James, I'm wondering what do you what do you think about based on your experience about um methods or the need to sort of incorporate and build safe space for people to tell their stories and how you achieve that, which can also be related to the writers you know you're building safe space and inviting somebody into your story yeah i mean in the classroom setting that's everything is the students think they can trust their peers to, to hear and, and all that is is modeling that as a as an instructor and that respect and once it's modeled it's easy but i was i had several thoughts after listening to to all of you and um you know in my writing what i've learned is it helps me to i like to write in public spaces because mm. coffee shops um yeah. there's life you know so there's such a, a pageant happening everywhere around us at every moment and um in my mind i find that if i'm if i'm in my my house it i i um it's harder to get those wheels turning, but if I'm among people, it just happens more easily. I also find that when I'm moving, when I'm exercising, when I'm, that's when the best ideas come to me. When I'm on my bicycle, yeah. um, 
the when the body moves the mind moves yeah. and i think that as a that's been the biggest lesson i've ever had as a, when i face writer's block mm. is um not just changing my environment but doing something vigorous and the, and that sort of unlocks w- what i'm trying to say and I, I think well why didn't i think of that earlier and then um you know, so th- those have been some lessons. I also think a lot about not just the beginning of a story, but how we're talking about how to end a story. The best stories I've ever read are ones that don't tell you at the end how you're supposed to take the story mm-hmm. or feel about it. They they just leave, they just finish it and, you, and you're left to find your own message. Mm-hmm. And I, 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 and I, theater the same way. Um, you know, why Why put together a big piece if at the end you're going to tell the audience what they're supposed to take from it? Right. I think that should be left to them. And, and the best stories are the ones that are complex and and, and the ending isn't clear. The, the, the message isn't clear at the end. That's how life is. You know, it's never crystal clear. So those are just some thoughts I have about the themes that are coming up and um. Yeah, I, I I find myself the the older I've gotten, the better I've gotten at this at storytelling. And I love that because, um, you know that's why how how I like to talk to people now is just through through telling them. I love to hear their stories too. You can mm-hmm. tell more about a person in in two minutes from a story than I think in any other way. And I was thinking about a quote. Um. I don't know who said this, the shortest distance between two people is a story. Mm. Oh, I love it. Yeah. And, and there's this great quote by um, Leslie Marmon Silko. She wrote, I will tell you something about stories. They aren't just entertainment. <laughs> um, don't be fooled. They're all we have, you see, all we have to fight off illness and death. So I, so we, we should never um, be dismissive or or minimize the value of stories and storytelling. I think there's a difference between telling a good story and writing a story. I, I'm, I'm terrible at telling stories because I put in too many words or I get sidetracked and it, It drifts off. But for me, writing hones down the thoughts to what what the what is the essence that then the reader can pick up and put in their own um, what they what they need to get from it. And and I think what I meant by how ending a story is as important to me as beginning it. But it's not to tell who's ever reading it that this is this is what I think and this is what you should think. It's really just to bring some kind of a message to to the ending for them to take away and think about and it, it's subtle it's not like you know a straightforward it's just a theme perhaps I don't know I I'd like to bring up a thought that is relevant to all all of the thoughts here is that um, these memoirs these stories are, little anecdotes and they are not necessarily linear in how the the story evolves. Uh, When I was editing many of the stories by just ordinary people for the Unplugged Voices book, I discovered that a great deal of it was plotting that there was too much there, just as you're saying, Wendy, that that the person haired off into the weeds somewhere and we lost what the anecdote, what the extraordinary thing was that was was the actual kernel of the story. And I had helped people to bring that back partly by getting a, a first sentence. So what I'm trying to say is that what you just said is terrifically important because it's very different in print than it is in the actual telling. Mm-hmm. Uh, back to Jim talking, I mean, James, when you're talking about 
the curtain going up. Um, I grew up at the opera because that's what my parents did. And you know, I always I got excited for what you were saying and how so many different senses come to bear. And, uh, and talk more about that. Uh, the, the people getting at you to, to smell whatever was going on to touch fabrics. I think I need you to clarify what you mean though by the smell and the touch. <laughs> well, I, to make sure I know what you're getting at. When, when the curtain goes up on a story, whether it's the writing of the story or the person performing as you spoke to how you have your students move into this cultural exchange idea. Um, we, want to, we want to have more than just words. We want to have inflection of the voice. We want to have excitement. We want to be able, um, the, the grandmother's extraordinary quilt, we want to feel the, the stitching on the top of the quilt. If she's baking bread, we want to get the feeling of how it was rosemary that she added. And, you know, it just, it, it, it came right in as a little cloud to us. So I think you're talking, Sarah, about the sensory experiences that are inherent in theater, as opposed to reading a story and how you can develop and expand the sensory experience. But we want it in the story too is what, what I'm saying is that that's when it is a written story that is so important and of course the um, choosing of the right words uh, makes all the difference and of course that's what good writing is all about. Well that that's an introspective person that that does the writing it's the extroverted person that can do the telling that can spontaneously create an audience by a joke an anecdote uh, a story um a recitation and um so it's there's two different sides to it you're either the person that can get on the stage and perform or you're the person who likes to be in your little quiet space and think of the right words the right sentences the right the right message. Uh, I guess I kind of went off in that direction because of the experiences of having a hundred people that I had to kind of shepherd into mm -hmm. telling in the written page that yeah. that had the attention right away. And of course, most people are, and they have no experience, and I don't care about that. I just want to hear their story, mm -hmm. and. Yeah. best and of course that's where the relationship had to develop yeah I could help them to put their best words forward uh you wendy and michelle yours were the only two stories that i never edited at all hmm. oh oh <laughs> well what, what i admire what, what i <laughs> What I admire in that is that I understand how skilled you had to be to to make people comfortable and ask the right ask questions that elicited the story. And that's so much of conversation where you're setting the table or it's your 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 students or whatever. How how is it that we can make people feel comfortable enough or or come up with a question or a joke or anything that will just get them to moving in the direction of a story? And I just delight in that when it ha you know when i when it happens but in a very in a more formal way you had to do that because you wanted this product in a sense for this book you know this became a consumable in a way it became something to be shared with many other people on a printed page and yet you, what you're saying is a lot of these folks weren't writers and I, I remember one time Forrest Fenn who i did some writing about he and has many books out he said i'm not a writer I don't know how to be a writer. I said, what are you talking about? But he, what he meant was he's a supreme storyteller. And there are many times I wish I were less of a writer and more of a storyteller, actually. Yeah. Mm. I have an anecdote I could share. I will share a story. And then maybe you all will share some stories too. I think that would be fun. So to bridge this gap from 
storytelling, verbal language, oral stories, to writing with students with disabilities at the middle school, school age <laughs> is mm -hmm. challenging. And I always started off my school year with my students telling them the first thing I was going to tell them a secret, which was the best pencil in the entire world is Ticonderoga number two pencil. They are awesome pencils. And I would have them, a lot of them in my classroom. And I, I would tell them never, you will always get a pencil here. You will never, ever, ever get in trouble for not having a pencil in my classroom. And I will always have pencils because I wanted to remove that barrier. And so then I would challenge them just kind of tongue in cheek and say, this is one secret about school because when you go out into the real world, you will never get in trouble for not having a writing implement. And I tell them, go anywhere and try it and just say, hey, can I borrow a pen? Or hey, can I borrow a pencil? You will never get in trouble. So I tried to use humor and make this connection and safe place uh, between the thinking and the oral language and the stories and the writing. There, that's my anecdote. Somebody else share a story. Well, I have to say that I love that one. And the title, of course, is <laughs> The World's Best Pencil. I, yeah. It's so much fun to come up with titles for other people's stories. That was very obvious, but it's a great story. Mm -hmm. I want you to tell a story. King has a story. I know he does. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'm think just thinking about a lot. Your your thoughts have, you know, triggered a lot of, a lot of stuff and you can't break storytelling down into a science or a formula you know it's a it's a human um effort but um back to the the theme of parenthood i my i have a 13 year old um who who was adopted and um so when when she was about five she started asking me daddy what am i you know in terms of her cultural identity I, I never knew what to say because we didn't have really any information hmm. so I never knew how to answer that question so I would just t tell her that she was half Irish because that's my my heritage <laughs> and leave it at that and then um so then uh, a couple of years later we did the DN DNA test and it's 48 percent Irish and it, and and it specified a different particular very specific part of Ireland because mm -hmm. I think because I, Ireland's a, an island nation that the, the, the genetic makeup is still very um, settled so you can so it's specified a very small area and um, the the Irish immigrants who came to Colorado in the 1880s to mine silver mm -hmm. have been researching them for they're buried in pauper graves up at 10,000 feet talk about stories I've been researching them for 20 years yeah. and it led to this big memorial that we built up there with the Irish government funded um but anyway the the area that they came from was a southwest was West Cork if you know Ireland it's in the southwest corner of the island yeah and and, and lo and behold that was the area that the, the DNA test said that my daughter's ancestors are from so now she'll when we go up there she'll say dad i might be these people might be my ancestors oh. and so i took her there last summer um just to because i think with adopted children they there is a, a there is an empty space mm -hmm. um when when they don't know um the story mm -hmm. of their own creation their own making mm -hmm. and the people that made them that's that's a big that's a big empty space and leads you know separation anxiety and abandonment trauma and all of that mm -hmm. so um to go there we went there to that village and um there were there was a mass grave where nine thousand people were buried during the famine it was like a football field the size of a football field and oh my goodness to watch my um nine-year-old weighed out into that field and she brought her school id mm -hmm. and and she found a a stone there that, that gave some of the history of the of the tragedy and she 
she just left it there and, and and you know as a parent that was so meaningful to me yeah so i think that um you know that what storytelling does more than anything else is is buffer us with a feeling of belonging you know the loneliness is the greatest curse of human kind, I, I think. yeah and so um storytelling is the anecdote i'm sorry the the um not the anecdote, the antidote. <laughs> the, the antidote to loneliness. Yeah. And, and uh, so I'll, I'll stop there. Those are just some things I've, I've been thinking about. Thank you. All right, Wendy, you have to tell another story. Well, what I'm thinking about is um, in writing down memories, which is kind of what the way I started, but it's, there's also... A, a quote that um, keep in mind that memory is a novelist because your memory is a memory of a memory. So what you remember and the way that it's transcribed eventually into an oral or a written story is it's like playing telephone it was, as kids. It often gets translated differently and, and that's okay. There's, there's nothing that says that there's an accuracy that has to be, you know, this, stark truth of whatever it's it's part of what makes the story real and makes it interesting is is the way you embellish or remember the little segues that you have or someone else says that reminds you of something and I don't know I just it's that's not really an anecdote but I I do think about that when I'm writing that it's this is my story that I'm writing about for someone else to read but it's you know it's whatever they want to take out of it it's there's no there's no hard truths here mm -hmm. michelle do you have another short bit to <laughs> i don't got no stories um <laughs> you know actually i think a lot because i've been working on a book for five years winding it up here and um it starts with the stories that my grandmother passed on to me accidentally in a pioneer women's oral history collection. And I thought I was bummed because I thought I want, you know, I wanted oral histories. Native people have oral histories. White people don't have any of that. And I did. And then a book in a bookstore almost fell on my head and it had contained these stories. My grandmother remembered this blizzard when she was five years old in South Dakota. Um, whole books are written about this one day. And she remembered being a five-year-old in the children's blizzard in 1888. And I'm like, wow, maybe, maybe in white culture, books are our elders. And, and then I had 900 letters from my father to my mother in the war. And, and that's when things just came at me and came at me and came at me. But I began to think how, how stories have to have beauty or meaning in them. They're not always pretty. So beauty or meaning. But if we had another hour, I would talk about the humor in all of it. Well, there's just so much on all of this. Um, Karen, do you have any um, questions or other things to add? We're about at the end of our time. I know I was getting, I got distracted and I wasn't even watching it because this was such an interesting <laughs> conversation. So yes, it is almost seven. So um, I want to um, thank everybody for joining for this conversation. And um, it it is recorded, so it'll be on our YouTube channel and I will send out the link to the panelists and then we'll have it on our website as well. I want to thank Sarah for moderating the conversation and also for her very lovely book of Unplugged Voices. Um, the museum is currently observing winter hours, so we're closed on Wednesdays and Thursday through Tuesday. We're open from 10 to 5 and there is a New Year's Eve ball event if anybody yeah. um, is listening and is interested in that they can get more information and tickets on our website i hope to have further conversations on this topic and um would love to invite you all back i really appreciate you sharing your journeys and your stories so thank you Sarah. karen um a have michelle and wendy give their websites 
uh, so people can read yes, more. Yes, you can put it. You can put it. Uh, you can say it out loud, and then it's on the recording, or you can type it into the chat as well. I'll just say it. It's michellepotter.com, but you have to spell Michelle with one L. michellepotter.com. Thank you for that. Hmm. Um, and mine is called a taste of mind, M I N D dot com. It's lovely. Thank you, Wendy. Mm -hmm. And James, I would love to connect with you on a um, professional level because I see so many, so much um, intersection potential with interpretive practices in the museum. So thank you for being here. Yeah, you, you have my email address. So um, yeah, sounds good. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Fun. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah. One more comment. Oh. Uh, after the success of the first volume of our unplugged Tiny Stories, Tiny Five Minute Read Memoirs, we are indeed recruiting people who want to tell their story in a second volume. So um, talk to me or talk to Karen. <laughs> I don't know, Sarah. I might have to be in that one. I might have to write yeah. a story. <laughs> going to be in that yes. as well okay. so now we're going to hold him to it so we thank you most kindly everybody mm -hmm. and have a beautiful holiday season fine holiday to you all and bye-bye thank you